Good morning everyone, my name is Will Smith and I'm the Executive Director of JCP Youth. We are a youth leadership company based in Tasmania and we deliver high impact youth programs for young people. JCP Youth falls under two arms. The first arm, which is our core business, is functioning a program called Beast. Beast is a program aimed at at-risk and vulnerable youth. The program aims to deliver youth leadership content to young people over a prolonged period of time. It's there set to enhance young people's way of life and try and turn them towards positive community engagement. We self-fund that program through our school-based seminars, guest speaking, and being able to positively influence and impact events and community groups. By delivering school seminars and delivering our youth leadership content, we are able to uh, engage people uh, in a business uh, and we utilise that money to pay our staff and then run and function, self-fund our own program. We're really fortunate to also have received over the last 12 months some donations and also run a fundraising event which has assisted in running uh, that BEAST program. A little bit about myself, uh, I grew up in northern Tasmania, right up until the age of 15 I was a little bit of a grey man in school, I was someone that uh, just fit into the crowd, I wasn't utilising any leadership capabilities, I wasn't utilising any leadership potential. At the age of 15 I was presented with an opportunity to go away on, an, on a program uh, or camp working with at risk and vulnerable youth as a volunteer. I attended the camp and I was partnered up with a young person where we spent a whole week engaging in trying to provide them an experience. I graduated from school as a college captain of St Patrick's College in Launceston. After that one camp experience, I then started to engage further from the age of 15 in other embracing opportunity uh, experiences that I had the opportunity of jumping into. That further developed me, my leadership capabilities to then get that college captain role. I graduated from school and I joined Tasmania Police. My background is actually in policing uh, for the, or the better half of a decade. I've been a police officer in Tasmania, I've held roles in uniform, uh, a country posting at Smithton, drug investigation services, prosecution services, and over the last few years I've been working as a tactical operator in a special operations group. All of these roles have provided me with a unique insight into the needs of Tasmanians and especially young people within our community. This all changed for me uh, in 2019, and this was the stem and the start of JCP Youth. What I want to impart on everyone here today is that I'm here to speak about what I call indirect influence. The story that I'm about to share with you now that started in 2019, I want to impress on you that indirect influence is something for me that is the biggest influence and impact on the young people we work with. Now I can talk about some statistics around our BEAST program later on and I can share with you some stories of young people that have come through the program. But first it's important to understand why the program exists in the first place with JCP. In 2019 we just finished a, a police job uh, and uh, I was absolutely exhausted, I hadn't actually slept in a couple of days, we'd been attending a high risk incident and I remember coming home to where I was living at the time which was Shearwater on the northwest coast of Tassie. In Shearwater, I plunked down on the couch. I turned the TV on and Sunrise, the breakfast TV show, was playing. As I was watching Sunrise, this news story, breaking news, popped up. There was a young person being walked from a, a police divisional van into a local remand centre in Melbourne. I immediately recognised that young man. In fact, that young man had just participated uh, during, during the course of his teenage years in one of the programs that I assisted in developing in Victoria. Not only that, I had personally mentored him for a period of two months. That young man had just raped and murdered a young woman at a Melbourne train station. I immediately was overcome with a sense of guilt. For almost 10 years, we were running and functioning youth programs across Australia for a number of different organisations as volunteers. We were going around and impacting and influencing young people and saying that we were drawing out the best version of themselves. From the ages of 10 right through to 17, we were working with young people, taking them on camps, activity days, experiences. And for that period of time, those young people we were working with 
we never end up, we never found out what the actual outcome was for that young person. Now, what I mean by that, uh, because I know that I probably didn't uh, pronounce that the right way, what I mean by that was when I was sitting on the couch watching Sunrise that day, I started to contact a lot of services that we'd actually done work for. Hey, we ran a program for you in 2011. Hey, we ran a camp for you in 2015. Hey, we interacted with some of your young people in 2016. And the same question was asked to every single service. Where are those young people now? Every single service that we interacted with were unable to answer that question. No one knew the outcome of any of the individual young people that we were working with. That was massive for me because I'd been receiving all this recognition. I've been walking around, people were patting me on the back going, oh, Will Smith has run this youth program. Will Smith's developed this youth program. Recognition here, recognition there. And what was happening is we were running these programs. Young people were coming into the program. We were running and functioning the program for them. And then we were kicking the young person back into their own environment. We were then walking off and getting recognition saying, hey, 2017, we work with a thousand young people. But even though we had a thousand young people come through the program, no one was looking at the actual outcome of that individual young person further down the track. So I jumped on social media. Within two days, I had searched up a whole heap of young people that we interacted with, worked with, not only here in Tasmania, across Victoria and other states as well. Almost every young person that we social media stalked was dead, locked up, completely disengaged or not positively engaging in school or other community activities. All of the young people had negative outcomes. For me, that's unacceptable, especially receiving a heap of recognition as to what, what I did. Within a few days, I handed my resignation letter into the police and fortunately it wasn't accepted. So over the last couple of years, I've been slowly transitioning out of the police to the point where about three weeks ago, I decided to finally resign. The process post-2019 and the news that happened that week, the process was that we wanted to create a company and a program that was purely based on outcomes. Not the amount of kids that came through, not the amount of programs that we run, not on any other statistic, only on what outcome was held for that individual youth later down the track. So we created the BEAST program. We collaborated with some organisations, one that had recently closed down here in Tasmania, and we wanted to know what their challenges were. We, we soon found out that young people didn't want to be associated with at-risk programs. They didn't want to be associated with programs that reformed youth offenders or that made them feel like they were vulnerable. Young people wanted to be uplifted, empowered. So we created BEAST. BEAST is a program that for them, they could genuinely look at and go, oh, I, I feel really proud. I feel really happy that I'm part of this program. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm achieving something. So we sold it as a leadership opportunity. We sold it as an opportunity for young people to heavily engage in something that they would get a lot of experience from. And they were proud to say they were part of it. BEAST is a program that delivers youth leadership content based on the point that we believe every young person has the potential to be a leader. Now, most young people don't use that potential. However, a lot of at-risk and vulnerable youth, especially youth offenders, kids caught up in disengaged or at-risk behaviours, those young people have resilience. And resilience is a major factor in releasing leadership potential. It's huge. So if we're able to tap into that resilience, if we're able to tap into some life experiences and tap into that leadership potential, we genuinely believed we could turn an at-risk young person from being completely disengaged into an active leader in our community. We first took the program to the Middle East. We wanted to impact and influence the most at-risk youth in the world. We wanted to go to an area in the Middle East which was on the border of Syria. So into Syria and around the borders where a heap of young people were being actively targeted for things like terrorist recruitment, disengaged behaviours, not engaging in school, not engaging in community activity because they're not allowed, and try and engage those young people in some of the content. And it worked. We travelled into the Middle East. We travelled into areas that were no-go zones. The Australian government said, you're not allowed to travel here. Agencies and services weren't interacting with these young people because they were 
point of, of, of being able to help. It was too unsafe. We travelled into these areas. We worked with up to 236 kids in the Middle East and engaged them, number one, in sporting groups and soccer groups so we then could start imparting some leadership content on them. And it worked. We then brought that process and that program back to Tassie and we refined it. We created a staged process for young people to go through. We created a process where young people could positively engage with people around them without thinking they were part of an at-risk or vulnerable youth program. Beast was designed here in Tassie and first opened up for 10 kids. We ran the program initially with five boys. We, we added another five in, in a second group. Those 10 boys, when they graduated from the program, had been a part of it for 10 months. Out of the 10 boys that engaged in the program, seven of them graduated as student leaders in their school. Three were finalists in the state volunteering awards for their mentorship of other at-risk kids. The group collectively raised $50,000 and gave it out across the state. Four students are current CCYP ambassadors. One's a current school captain of a school. All of the boys have a 0% offending rate above 80% attendance rate at school. That's massive. And we're really proud of that statistic and we're trying to drive that with every single participant that we can engage in on the program. But it's based on outcomes. We work the program in a young person's home life, we work it in their school life and in the community. You'll see me have an unshaven face right now. I have an unshaven face because I was out at 1am last night at Wynyard working with young people on the street to get here in Launceston to film this for you today. This, this program has no time constraints. We don't work from 9am to 3pm. The, the program has to be based around individual young people. Some young people in the program need us every single day. Some young people in the program need us just every once a week. Some young people need food, clothing, registrations for sports. Some young people need assistance with their education, with their attitude, with their personality development and personal development. So the program differs for every young person. However, they must all engage in camps, activity days, and processes and programs that benefit them as an as a actual group. A lot of people ask us what, what I think the success is of the program or what I think we do that could be a little bit different. One, we have a strategy where when a young person graduates from the program or engages in the program, that strategy is that then they can transition into a youth leader and they work for us mentoring other at-risk young kids. And that's been recognised in the recent volunteering awards here in Tassie where three boys are recognised for their contribution back to working with, with other at-risk kids. However, the actual success individually for the program is, is something that I call indirect influence. Now, this is not a new term for anyone watching this video. In fact, this is not a new term for anyone at all in uh, this Anglicare seminar. What I, what I want to impart on you is that the process or the research behind indirect influence and, and the term, whilst I, I use this term, there are many other terms for it, this process is known, it's common, and we need to put a lot more faith in it. We need to put a lot more recognition to the fact that it works. We know through proven research, not just for young people, in fact, for everyone watching this video, for everyone in the world, we know through proven research that we are heavily impacted by the top five people we spend the most time with. We're heavily impacted. Our thoughts, our actions, our opinions are all heavily impacted by the top five people we spend the most time with. Now, those top five people, I'll give you an example. My best friend, his name's Flea. We've grown up together ever since we were young. Last year, I was the best man at his wedding. Me and Flea, to this day, we're best friends. Flea's not in my top five. He's not in the top five people I spend the most time with. He can't be because sometimes I'm a negative influence on him and he's a negative influence on me. What we must understand is that even though those top five people exist, we still have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we can put important people in our life in those other areas. But those top five people, the top five people we spend the most time with, they should drive us to achieve and to be the best version of ourselves. They're the people who make us feel uncomfortable. They're the people we want to put in there because they've achieved something we want to achieve. They're the people that we feel nervous around because we want to impress them. They're the people that we want to tell all the good things to and we want to hide all the bad things from. Those top five people we should be driving in our own lives, not just young people's lives, every, every life, 
um, should should be driving a top five. I've got people in my top five right now at this very moment that I don't like. I've got a guy called Cray who lives in New South Wales. Craig's a guy that we, we're constantly back and forth communicating with. However, me and Craig don't see eye to eye. In fact, when he calls my phone, I think, oh, but I have to have Craig in my top five. He has to be there because he forces me to be the best version of myself. He asks me about my values. He asks me about the direction that I'm heading. He questions everything that I'm doing and he makes sure that I'm on the right path. So for me, I have to have Craig in my top five. I actively seek out people to be in my top five. I look up people on the internet. I find people that have done things that I aspire to do and I contact them. I harass them until I can get an hour's meeting or an hour a day for a week and I force that person during my day, my week or maybe my month to be in my top five so I can suck value from them, so I can get as much value from them as I possibly can. What I'm explaining to you right now is actually the secret that we use for our young people. All we do to drive success in our program is we take over a young person's top five and we do it through what's called indirect influence. The young people have no idea that by spending more time with us, our volunteers, other youth in the program, when they spend more time with us, all we're doing, it's, it's, a, it's simplistic, all we're doing is we're indirectly influencing their thoughts, their actions and their opinions. But that indirect influence for us, we're fortunate because when a young person joins the program, there's no end date. So if it takes them three years to do the program and it might take another kid 10 months, no problem. If it, if it takes that long to get through the content, no worries, no issues at all. There's no end date. So a young person can transition and move through as quickly or as slowly as they want. But once they finish the program, they can continue to engage with us. But we have to force that indirect influence. Some young people, once they've graduated, they're keen to, to work with at-risk youth and to still engage with us. However, we might not be in their top five once they graduate. So that indirect influence must be driven in their life. They must learn that people in their life are having a major, major influence over their thoughts, their actions, and what they think of the world around them, their opinions. They must understand that. Then they must learn on the program that, in, and, and I'm talking about 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. This, this is not just relevant to one specific age. I'm talking about youth of all ages must learn the influence other people have on them. Now, influence isn't easy to pick up. So we teach on the program about how people around them actually influence their thoughts, actions, and opinions. I don't tell any young person to not swear on our program. I haven't, in the, I reckon in the last year and a half, I have not preached to anyone, hey, we don't swear here. Because once a young person steps into the JCP environment, they would feel extraordinarily uncomfortable to swear. That's the influence that we drive. When we place a young person back in their home environment, that influence has to be created there as well. We, we put our own posters up on their wall, we strip their bedrooms out at times, we can wash their own clothes and bed sheets in our own detergent, we can create that influence, but we also need to create it so we might not be able to directly influence their family members or their individual friends, but we can influence their ability to, to connect with and interact with other people around them who may be positive influences, who may be good uh, people to, to drive inspiration and impact from. We must teach that on the program. It has to be self-driven and it has to be taught to young people so they can pick it up. If we were all sitting in a room right now, all two, three, four hundred of us, if we were sitting in a, in a room, I'd actually run an activity with you because I want to prove to you how indirect influence works. Now, we're not in that situation, so I'll explain the activity. But the activity runs where we can actually uh, force young people into a room we can force young people into, into a room uh, and there can be up to two, three, four hundred young people. Now, in that specific room, uh, in that specific room, we would place a facilitator in the middle. The facilitator would get everyone to walk in any direction in the room. You can walk that way, you can walk this way, you can walk diagonal. Most kids bump into each other. They're being silly and doing stupid things. Now, then we give each of the kids instructions. The first instruction is to clap. Second instruction is to jump. The third instruction is to stop. And then we mix and match it. Stop, clap, jump, and all the kids start doing the actions. 
We then follow it up by reversing the action. So when I say clap, you have to jump. And when I say jump, you have to clap. When I say stop, you have to start. When I say start, you have to stop. What ends up happening every single time we run this program without fail, every single young person in the room ends up walking in the same direction around the facilitator in the room in a circle. They have no idea they're doing it. They have no idea that, that, that they've just created a circle walking around because they're too focused on the fact that they need to jump when they need to clap, clap when they jump. What this proves to us is that we can change a young person's physical actions. We can change the direction they walk, the way they walk and how they walk, even the speed. We can change all of that without them even knowing. And then when we make them aware of it, when we show them a video back of them all changing their behaviors, literally turning around to change direction without even knowing, speeding up, slowing down, conforming to the group, we can show them how indirect influence works. Indirect influence works by young people following the actions or mirror imaging what's going on around them. As I said, this is not new to you watching this video. We know this, but this is an activity to showcase how it actually works. The biggest drive that we have of influencing and impacting young people is taking over that top five. Those top five people, the people that we should have in our life that take over the majority of our time, a lot of services will say, well, we can't dedicate that amount of time to a young person. A lot of services will say, well, it doesn't matter how much time we put in, this young person will always go back to their home environment and we might have them walking around in a circle, but they'll be zigzagging within an hour once we drop them off. That's completely understandable. And I suppose the success, uh, not so much the success, but the drive of what we do is we can influence them in all these different areas. But we must teach young people that they have to reach out. They have to find people within their life who are those positive influences. Now, a way around this is recently, up until literally last week, we, we drive uh, this. I had three boys approach me and they said, hey, listen, we just can't. We don't know anyone. We don't have any positive influences in our life. We don't know people who are able to, you know, be in that top five. So we created a program called Catch Up where a bunch of community members, business owners, people who are influenced, all people who obviously have the, the qualifications of a working with children card and, and have been ticked off and appropriate. We created a list of people who are happy to catch up with kids. So a young person without, without knowing that those, sorry, that's my alarm to make sure I don't go over time. The young people that we interact with without even knowing that these people are involved in the program these young people will cold call a person so that on every Sunday night they're given a name and a phone number. They'll cold call this person and say, hey, my name is such and such. I got your number from Will Smith. He said that you'd be a great person to draw some value from. Do you have any opportunity where we might be able to meet up this week? 52 people in a year, that's the opportunity we provide young people. And we're yet to have a young person not pick up the phone and call through on the very first week we've started running it, which is now. So we're providing that opportunity for people to interact, sorry, providing the opportunity for young people to interact with people who would be good in their top five. For those people watching this video, that's my encouragement to you. I know we're hesitant to interact young people with different people around our community, but it takes a community to raise a child. We must step a little bit out of our comfort zone and interact young people within our community who they can draw value and benefit from. They don't just want it, they need it in order to draw their top five up, in order for them to see what their aspirations can be, and in order for them to properly goal set. It is so important, it is so important that young people have a wide exposure to people within our community. And for most young people, they can't drive that themselves. So if I'm working a 9 till 4 p.m. job, in that 9 till 4 p.m., I know young people are at school between 9 till 3. So my interaction with young people is going to be extremely limited. But 
What I can drive is the influence of willing community members to interact with those young people. Of course, the program that we run comes with a whole range of rules, regulations and, and, and reporting um, to make sure that it's safe for young people. However, it works. And we prove that it works because over the last two years, that's our drive. My message today through indirect influence, and I'll finish on this, is to make sure you understand that there's a difference. We know when we're being influenced. We don't know when we're being indirectly influenced. Indirect influence happens when we change our thoughts, actions and opinions and we don't even know it. We know when someone walks into the room and goes, what's good, what's good, what's good and hypes us up. We know we're being influenced in a good way. But it's when we're in negative situations or sometimes positive situations, we don't even know that that influence is occurring. We don't know that that's happening because it's indirect. We're just being around that person, so we mirror image what they do. The more exposure we get for young people to be around these people, it lifts their aspirations, it lifts their ability to goal set, and it lifts their ability to want to be a better version of themselves because they see people doing it. It's not good enough that they hear about it. It's not good enough that they sit down and talk about it. They have to experience it. And the life skills they get by interacting with a whole range of different people sets them up for a absolute plethora of things in life. I've rambled, I've jumbled on, and I've just spitballed a whole heap of things to you impromptu, but I want to show you my passion and I want to make sure you understand that what I'm talking to you about is not something I'm going to read off a script. Um, I'm obviously jumping into a Q&A with you now, and I hope that you have some, some questions for me, but please understand this. It takes a community to raise a child. Before you look elsewhere for what other people can do for young people that you're working with, you should always ask yourself, what can I do above and outside of my role to make sure that this young person is cared for, is nurtured, and is heading towards a successful future? Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Live, love, enjoy life, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Will, thank you so much for that. That was really informative and inspiring, and we love that you had your little uh, alarm go off in your phone. You didn't miss a beat when you uh, got that text message. I hope it wasn't anyone important that you were bypassing. <laughs> Don't worry, there's no one more important than Anglicare Tasmania. That's my go-to. Excellent. Well, you've certainly uh, made an impact on our audience today. We've got lots of really positive feedback. And I think the overwhelming one that I'll start with is about whether or not you do have enough workers on the ground and how people can actually volunteer to assist and, and be a part of your program and offer their expertise and guidance to help you on your journey. Because there's a lot of people here who have put their hands up saying they'd love to be able to help. Yeah, 100%. So there we have, uh, we accept volunteers from across Tasmania. Um, and the volunteer base uh, is run by uh, one of our amazing uh, staffers, Emma. She um, puts people through a process. So there's an interview process. And it's quite a stringent process because we're really, really big on making sure that the people that represent uh, us with our kids obviously uh, reflect our, our own values. Um, but there are a number of ways you can volunteer. Some, some volunteers just want to come on camps and activity days uh, and uh, sort of hype guys, that we call them, um, or girls. And uh, some volunteers are keen to mentor. Um, and so they pair one-on-one -on -one with a, a young person within the community and they have a catch-up once a week. Um, and that catch-up is quite heavy in relation to we send you content that you'll run through with the young person. And then sometimes we just have community members I spoke about at the end of the speech who just have a catch up session, but that's only a one off. So it's not, you just catch up with one kid. It might be once every couple of weeks. Um, and then you move on to a different kid and your role is just to offer them value and answer some questions that they might have. So yeah, you can, uh, you can contact our volunteering uh, base at an email address, which is council at jcpyouth.com.au. Um, and then you can start to go through the process to, to volunteer. Yeah. Can you go into a little bit more detail about how the young people are actually sourced that end up being involved in the program? You've spoken about boys and, and there's another question too about uh, whether or not there's something available for, for girls into the future. Yeah, 100%. So we initially started the program by sourcing young people ourselves out on the street. Um, just due to my background in policing and uh, I suppose my heavy involvement with at-risk youth, I identified a heap of young people across the state who I thought would benefit from this program. So we 
uh, I suppose, went and just sourced these kids from areas out on the street to start the program. Now we accept referrals from anywhere. So uh, referrals come from child protection, other services, parents, schools. Our biggest referral for young people at the moment is actually young people themselves. Uh, we have young people refer themselves to the program because they know of someone who's in it or they've seen some benefit of it. Um, and so they'll usually message through on Instagram or uh, Facebook and say, hey, how can I get involved? The girls uh, is a really good point to make. This program uh, is not for every young person um, and it's not for uh, young people who, I suppose, um, the... Uh, the energetic side of the program fits. This, we need young people to want to participate. So initially the program uh, was designed for, uh, to try and accommodate for a whole range of young people and boys were attracted to it to start. However, our core focus this year is to really increase our female participants. We have some female participants in the program at the moment. They're very camera shy. They hate going on social media and showing they're part of the program, but they do benefit from it. Um, in saying that we only have six across the state and we aim to build that. So we've just started a program called Development Camps, which is a three-day opportunity for any young person to come and experience a little bit of the content, um, the physical aspect of the, of the program, and it hopefully will give us an insight to try and convince more girls to join. On the 26th of March, we've just opened up the first development camp for boys. And then we're going to open it up for girls and then actually for adults. So to give an opportunity for us to impart content on everyone. But our core focus, which is led by Jade, who's in our office, is to really build our female participation in the program because we're tweaking it a little bit in relation to the physical aspect and sort of the lots of mountain climbs and things that you have to go through. Um, but we think the content is so relevant to young girls. We had a pilot program last year with females. We had seven females from across the state attend a camp and it was by far the best result we've had of any kid coming on a pilot program for beasts. So um, we're really keen to increase that, but we accept referrals from anywhere. And so it's great that people are putting their hands up themselves, but is there actually an eligibility criteria that you do have to go through before you accept people into the program? So we, um, yeah, we have a big waiting list for young people. The biggest, yeah. I suppose, we have the BEAST program and it's quite intense. Some kids require, require, sorry, require us to be there every day. An example is, so I was up at 5 a.m. this morning because one of our boys has to get to the gym. So, you know, we have to, we have to be there every single day for him because his goal is, is to get to the gym every morning, you know, at 5.30 a.m., someone has to be up at that time. And usually that's me because no one else will do it. But, but some <laughs> I kids, should come with you. <laughs> yes, exactly. But some kids only require contact once a week. So it differs. Every participant has a completely different experience in the program. Some kids don't need that contact once a week. Once they graduate, they're happy just to stay in, you know, irregular contact. So every participant uh, is different. They have to be what we consider to be an at-risk young person. And we consider an at-risk young person to be a person that may struggle to transition into adulthood successfully. So that might be through academics. It might be through their, you know, um, their social skills, communication skills, their ability to, um, you know, uh, contribute to the community. So there's a range of, you know, I think if you went to a school, I reckon 70% of the kids would be eligible for the program. They also have to want to do the program. Now, in saying that, I recently went to a house down south where a young person, I walked in, the young person told me to F off straight away. It took six weeks to get that young person to want to do the program. So we can assist with getting kids to want to do it. Um, but now he's in it. He's benefiting massively from it. But just because they don't want to do it doesn't mean they're ineligible. We just need to put a bit more effort into them. But they can't start the program unless they do want to do it because we can't push our content onto them. and We can't get them to be the best version of themselves unless they're willing to go, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. So with all of these waiting lists and, and interest in the programs, how is it actually funded and will it be funded into the long term? And Amanda's saying, is the government assisting? Yeah, cool. So uh, that's a really good question. So um, funding is obviously the biggest part of the program. So uh, initially uh, I self-funded the program and until we created a model, um, which we use now. So we self-fund the program through the work that we do. So right now I'm in the Windara Community Centre in Smithton. And I'm here because I'm running a conference with all the staff here and we're teaching them the exact 
exact same content that we would teach young people out on the street. They're going to pay us to be here today and we use this money to self-fund the program. So we actually have staff across the state. So our facilitators, Josh, Sam, Jade, they work in schools. So yesterday they were in Summerdale Primary, the day before they were in Mole Creek Primary. So whilst all our kids are in school, we then go on to deliver content out uh, to businesses and schools. We earn money, we self-fund the program. Um, that obviously limits the amount of kids that we can work with uh, and it limits our capacity to work with young people. So, yeah, we'll definitely look to source funding in the future. However, um, you know, I had a meeting yesterday in relation to funding and my, my biggest gripe is making sure that funding bodies and even yeah, whether that's the government, a philanthropist or, or some other funding body, they don't package our program to say, you know, yeah, it goes for 10 months and then that's it we must recognize that every individual young person requires something different. They all have differing costs. Some kids are really cheap to have on the program. Some kids are exceptionally expensive. We feed, we probably have five kids in the program. We feed every day. So, um, you know, for us, it's making sure that they're eating healthy, that they're, they've got something good to eat and, and they don't have the capacity or the people around them to provide that. Some kids don't, we don't need to provide that. So, it, it, funding can be really difficult because a lot of grants and applications will want you to fall under certain parameters and we're really difficult because we could work with kids at 2am in the morning right through to whenever and um, you know I, I'm not changing any of that because what we're doing is working and we can't change it just to fit a funding model yeah. So is there an opportunity you've said about being in, in schools um, to perhaps go in and speak to staff um, and young people at Ashley Youth Detention Centre? Yeah, 100%. We'd love to, uh, to interact with Ashley and we'd love to interact with the young people in there. The content's relevant for them and it's content that they would benefit from. Um, it's just, a, it's just a, a, about engaging uh, our office and, and Jade in our office to, to organise a time and a date for us to go in. And obviously we would need to be an approved agency to be able to go in and, and deliver uh, programs. And that's just not up to us. So that would just be up to Ashley as to whether they would be happy to have us in there. Yeah. And just, um, I suppose, behind the scenes, when you were developing these programs, uh, one of our attendees asked, um, did you create all of the concepts yourself or did you source experts to help formulate the program? Like what sort of research have you factored in yeah. to, to make sure that you do get the best results? Yeah. So the content that we deliver, so things in relation to, you know, having a top five, well, we deliver a lot of content uh, to young people. That content uh, is a mixture of things that I've developed that our team has developed, uh, but also based on research. So, I mean, there's basic concepts like, you know, the top five people you spend the most time with, you know, heavily influence your thoughts, actions, and opinions. I didn't develop that. That's just through a research paper that I was reading and thought, well, you know, if, if that research paper is true, then let's see if we can try and implement it. The actual program itself, so the three-step process, stepping up, stepping back, stepping forward, those three stages, moving through the program, doing things like the gym sessions, mountain climbs, the mirror imaging sessions of, you know, mentoring, that's all things we've developed. Um, and it's been developed on what we think genuinely works. So I've been involved yeah. in youth programs for the better half of a decade, and it's easy to see what's genuine, what works, and what's just there as an experience. We don't want to provide our young people with an experience. We want to provide them with something that genuinely works. Yeah. Um, one question is uh, from Wendy saying, what age do you take young people? And I suppose the secondary question would be, obviously we know that children learn so much from an early age. Is there some way of, of taking the program that you do now with more youth and adolescents through to some of the younger at-risk kids that perhaps we, we see and work with? Yeah, look, Tasmania Police has taken the stance that they've taken police officers out of colleges and are putting them into primary schools because they identify that we need to invest a lot more in younger people. The content we deliver uh, is really, really well, um, I suppose, accepted by kids who are 13, 14, 15 years of age. We start the program at 11. So we, we do accept, we actually have a kid in the program who's 10 years old or who started when he was 10. Um, this particular program works well with kids who are a little bit older just so they understand the content a bit. But the actual drive or value from mirror imaging and mentoring, the, the kids who are younger, they benefit a lot from. I suppose it's a lot easier for us to try and create student leaders in schools, which is part of the transition pathway. Like we've got a kid today, I'm on standby, my phone's about to ring. 
because he's applied for a student leadership role down south and it's been the biggest thing all week because if he gets it, then he is in a position where he's, well, he, he'll graduate from the program on that. So, you know, um, for in order to build that, it's a lot easier to do with kids who are a bit older as opposed to kids who are a bit younger. But the content we deliver goes down to grade five. So we do deliver content for grade fives in schools, but just, yeah, we find it really hard to relate it to kids who are younger. Yeah, I can imagine. It makes me a bit nerve, uh, tingly. My, I've got an 11-year-old son and I just think what you're doing is brilliant. Um, another question, I suppose, following on from the Ashley um, question earlier, when children leave Ashley, is there some way that the, the program you might be able to offer them post being, yeah. um, being there? Yeah, look, this is my personal opinion. Uh, and that is that we, I think that as, um, you know, as a community or as a state, we really, really um, don't do a transition out of Ashley well. Um, and I think we don't do a transition out of a lot of things well, but Ashley's a really big one. Um, you know, I've worked with kids that come out of Ashley who literally get allocated a one hour appointment a week. Uh, we're talking about an at-risk, vulnerable youth who's who's negatively contributing to the community. Uh, and our response as a community is to give him a one-hour meeting. And if he doesn't attend, then there's no consequence. Um, so I, I think that our program would work really, really well with kids who are coming out of Ashley and they can step into a mentoring program. They need some experience experience of the program prior to stepping out in Ashley in the school just so they have they know what they're stepping out into um, I suppose it's just being able to connect with those young people uh, and making sure that they fit the criteria as well because it, it the program isn't for every single young person that steps out of Ashley there are some traits skill sets personalities that that just wouldn't fit well with the program but there are definitely some that would so it's just creating that I suppose that communication with them yeah. Uh, a very simple question, and I suppose we're all used to dealing with acronyms all the time. We, we forget to say, what does JCP actually stand for, someone's asked? Yeah, really good question. So when we created the company, we just wanted a constant reminder, not only for us, but for the young people we work with of what our core values are. So JCP is actually an acronym for a name, and that name is John Cobbler Pounds. John Cobbler Pounds was a, a, a guy who lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s. At the age of 14, he became disabled after falling off the docks where he lived. Uh, and he opened up a cobbler shop fixing people's shoes. Uh, but for, the, for his entire life, from 15 years of age, right through until when he passed away, he uh, assisted at-risk and vulnerable youth every single day, helping them to read, write. He fed them, he clothed them. He was not affiliated to any religion, political group, anything at all. He was his own individual person. He received no recognition, no money, no funds to do it. Um, he self-funded it himself. And so for us, we just draw so much value from his story. And we think it's something that is a really, really good story to pass on to our kids. So we use his acronym as a daily reminder to make sure we um, you know, live by that value. We don't get caught up in any other mess or, or anything going on. We just want to make sure that that's our core focus. Yeah, got a question from Tiana asking, have you found that being a police officer has affected the way that the youth respond to you? Um, in a positive way, I do. Yeah, I think, um, especially when I was, I mean, I, I haven't been a police officer now for four weeks. I feel really vulnerable, by the way. But I, um, but being a police officer, I think uh, we broke down a lot of barriers and, and young people, it gave them a point of contact. Um, just because rarely would I meet a young person, they wouldn't know who I was. So prior to meeting me, they'd already chatted with friends or someone else. And so there was this level of, I suppose, uh, there was a level of respect already there. And so I found it really easy to connect and communicate with young people across the state. Um, and so it broke down a bit of a barrier. I didn't know. I never found any issues with it. Um, my brother's a police officer currently. And so I had a kid ring me a couple of days ago saying, your brother's locked me up. He's a piece of crap, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, it, it always has its challenges. But yeah, uh, no, not really. And my, my role with the police uh, had, didn't have anything to do much out on the street. So I worked in a specialist role. Um, you know, dealing with high risk incidents. And so um, I never interacted with kids out on the street uh, much. So yeah, it's, um, I suppose that gave me a bit of a barrier as well. Yeah. Um, another question is how can you support young people who are homeless? Yeah. Uh, so some, some kids involved in our program do uh, at times during the program uh, become homeless. Um, we really struggle with this. Um, it's, yeah, our communication with services uh, to try and get young people into a safe place is difficult. Uh, I find it really frustrating. 
Uh, it's something that takes a long time. Uh, and quite often we will just source our own accommodation just through um, connections that we have. We have people that are willing to take kids on for a night or two, just while we try and help sort their back end situation out. And then, so we don't even approach services sometimes if we think that we can do it. We're really fortunate to have a couple of families in Launceston and a couple of families down south, and they're just really accepting to have a young person come and stay with them. And, and they've gone through our volunteer process. They've got all their working with children checks and police checks, and they have their own families themselves. And so we feel like they're a really good place of safety it doesn't assist because we should be referring them to services. So the numbers are reported and statistics are reported, but also it's just a really frustrating process when we're just constantly told, well, we just don't have anything available, but yeah, I think that's a big issue in the state at the moment. Yeah. So there are some amazing people out there willing to open their homes, which is 100%. just phenomenal. Uh, another question is, um, do you base your indirect influence approach on a particular theory or theories? Yeah, yeah, hundred. So it's based on our content. So, um, so it's hard to, I suppose, go through our content without having you guys here for a whole day. But the content is based all around things like developing life skills. So, you know, the the actual traits of being a leader or a team player. You know, that directly relates those life skills and that content directly relate through to employment, relationships, friendships. It directly relates to your interaction with family members. So that indirect influence, we actually use that to uh, influence young people. So when we have a mentor session, there's no mentor session that's ever run without that indirect influence happening with some content. There's, there's an underlying feature. So a volunteer will catch up with a young person and they've already read through a sheet that we've developed saying, when you catch up with a young person, this is the core message that we really want them to get today. And the core message might be something as simple as, you know, the ability to address an incomplete, something that they need to apologize for or something that, you know, that they've done wrong that they need to address and sort in their life. And so we're not sitting them down and lecturing them about that. We actually want to go and teach them in community. We want to get someone who also needs to say, sorry, I, I do it all the time. I, I, I have kids with me and I'll make a phone call to someone and say, Hey, listen, mate, we, had a little bit of an argument. Um, you know, last night I went to a, a community meeting. Uh, this is, a, I'll give you a real example. I went to a community meeting and this guy called me a uh, F head or whatever. And, and we, I'd never met him before, but I called him this morning with a kid in the car and just, and, and just addressed that incomplete and just said, listen, mate, I apologize if I've, if I've put you off. And that's how we develop life skills. That's, and that I, the only reason I did that is so we can indirectly influence that young person. He sees how I deal with a problem. We, we indirectly influence him that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, saying sorry, always a, a good one. Um, how do you keep motivation for the young people to keep going during the program and after they leave, asks Tiffany. Uh, how do I stay motivated? No, how, how do you ensure that the children who once they've yeah. finished and graduate, I know you've got um, results for, you know, yep. short term after they leave, but ongoing, how do you ensure they stay motivated and true to what they've learned? Yeah, 100%. Uh, it just... We offer them positions, so uh, and we're still going through that process. That's something because we never want an end date. We always want to make sure we have some type of interaction. So they step into a youth leader role when they graduate, and then what? It's it's about them being able to transition into something else and something else. So we've been coming up with roles like the trailblazer role, coming up with roles where they can achieve something, and there's always something to aspire to. So, you know, we have kids now delivering youth leadership content. We've got kids coming up with their own programs, their own uh, change projects in community. And so every time they achieve something, there's not a lot of congratulations from us. We call it creating a new normal. We just say, if you achieve something, that's it. That's your new normal. That's just who you are now. Let's look towards what we can do next. So, yeah, for those young people, it's just all about creating something new, getting them, giving them a new direction. Um, and at times that can be time consuming and other times it doesn't because they're able to engage in that content themselves yeah. and move up. Yeah. We've got time for two more questions. Otherwise, these guys behind the scenes will set an alarm on me. Um, are you finding that not only disadvantaged children are coming from socially challenged areas or are you finding that kids from all areas are having trouble? That question's from John. All areas. Yep. We have kids who come from extremely wealthy backgrounds who are the most disrespectful, uh, youth offending uh, street rats, we call them. Uh, and we and they are uh, and that's 
not the title. They're actually the loveliest kids. Um, but we have kids from all walks of life, from all areas. Um, no, I don't think that it directly relates to low socioeconomic areas. Uh, I think that there's a higher percentage in low socioeconomic areas. Uh, I, I, and that's not based on any statistic. That's just my opinion. Um, but I think that, uh, I think, no, it comes from all areas. And we have kids in the pro, we have parents contact us saying, hey, listen, we've got really high paying roles. We do this, this and this. And we've got kids who are, you know, have achieved a whole lot of success. And we've just got this one kid who is on the edge of going to Ashley and we don't know what to do. Yeah. Well, just finally, because we have run out of time, unfortunately, but I suppose a final comment, a big thank you because everyone has really uh, drawn a lot of inspiration and there's lots of comments that have come through saying they're going to, you know, start implementing some of your workings in their own communities um, at their levels. Mm -hmm. But I suppose um, a number of people will be watching this. We have recorded it. So for, for when they're watching it back themselves, just perhaps reiterate, how can people get involved in some way? How can they refer um, people that, that they think might be in need? So just a, a final quick pricey from you. Yeah, brilliant. So we're at updating our website i would encourage you to hold off until our website updates because the referral process will be a lot easier uh, and will make a lot more sense but you can go onto our website jcpyouth.com.au and refer a young person you'll also be able to volunteer uh, and you'll also be able to get in contact my phone literally runs 24 7 um, because that's just the nature of work that we do and you can call me anytime my mobile's 0439 909 670 if you want to contribute or benefit the young people in the state if I can uh, offer you an opportunity to do that through some of our work I would encourage it but I always encourage people first look within your own circles as to what you can do first before you reach out to us we're at capacity for young people at the moment until we're able to increase our model to earn more money so we can sell fund more work. So, um, but yeah, we're always open to, to being able to influence and impact in any way. So perhaps a call out as well to any businesses that might have some spare cash floating around to, to invest in your program. They can get involved. They can ring you on that number too. I'm sure they we'll get can, our behind I the scenes. Hate asking <laughs> I know it's never easy, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. We will put your mobile number up in the Slack um, section as well. So people can um, write that down and, and get in contact with you. You'll have your phone buzzing hot even more, but I'll let you go because I do know that you've got this conference to do. Thank you so much. It's certainly been a pleasure to listen to you today. Thanks guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Rachel.